Welcome to our presentation. I am Simon Davis, Senior Gardener and Biodiversity Champion here at York St. John University. I'm joined by Nadine Davies, our Hedgehog Champion, and Rob McCune, our Bird Champion. I've been working in the ground team at York St. John for 23 years. In that time, I've become the go-to person for anything with wings and stings. I get called out on many false swarm alerts during the summer months. And my favorite memory of one of these is an abundance of hoverflies causing mischief around hanging baskets outside our reception at Lord Mayor's Walk. In 2017, I was asked to become the university's keeper of bees. We purchased some brand new nice hives known as horizontal top bar hives. These were seen as being more bee friendly, allowing the bees to build their wax combs as nature intended. And were also, as a bonus, a nice working height to avoid the beekeepers back. At the rear of the Lord Mayor's Walk campus, we have a wild colony of bees. These swarmed in 2017, and I managed to persuade them to take up residence in one of our brand new hives. I was lucky enough to team up with an experienced local beekeeper who mentored me for the first couple of years. The hive CU used was supplied for a project supported by Eat Natural, the snack bar people, and were made from recycled pallet wood. In 2019, the acre rapidly expanded to seven hives after an event I call Swarmageddon. Five swarms all out at the same time. This was my first beekeeping blunder. This is a picture of a queen bee, very rarely seen. So I thought I'd just share this one with you. Many people think that she is the matriarch of the hive and everything revolves around her. Things couldn't be quite a bit more different. She's basically an egg laying machine capable of laying up to 2000 eggs a day. Her destiny is decided by her attendees, uh, her sisters, the worker bees. This frame shows um, sealed brood and um, if you look carefully you can see emerging worker bees. The main honeybees that you'll see out and about are worker bees. These are foraging for nectar, pollen and water, the three main staples for bee life. Pollen is collected into pollen baskets located on the bees' back legs and taken back to the hives. Other honeybees you will see are the boys. These are the big bumbly with things with great big boisterous eyes. They only have one thing on their minds, but they are booted out of the hive at the end of summer because girls rule in the honeybee world. This is a frame of pollen um, surrounded at the top with a glistening clear liquid, which is basically the nectar brought in off the plants. You'll see there's a myriad of different colours representing all the different plants and trees that the bees have visited. The colours of the pollen um, shown here, this was a photograph taken in July. I've managed to identify horse chestnut, blackberry, oilseed rape or brassicas like sprouts and anything like that so that's gone to flower and the nice bright orange one is a lime. In 2021 we decided to change away from the horizontal top bar hives. These were proving notoriously hard to manipulate. Manipulations take place every seven to ten days so halfway through the season the honeybees and the top bar hives were getting angry and were ready to meet you when you walked into the apiary. Top bar hive would take me around about 50 to 55 minutes to go through, um, where the new national hives that we see here, about 20 maximum. I had to be inventive to get the bees to move out of their nice new cozy home into the top bar hives and out of the top bar hives into the national hives. I did this by separating the queen, putting her into the new boxes that you can see on top, separated with what they call a queen excluder, and then persuaded the bees over the next month to make their way up into the new hive. I'm pleased to say that as of this afternoon, the bees are still flying in out of that new hive. I'm very pleased to 
with the results. Beekeeping isn't all rose-tinted spectacles. And this is my second beekeeping blunder, which was trapping a bee inside my veil and I paid the price with a sting on the eyebrow. Very painful. As you can see, pollination is not all about the honeybee. Pollination takes place with lots of different insects, um, from micro moths right the way through to great big hoverflies and bees. Also, pollination takes place with birds, like the hummingbird, and bats, fruit bats. 2019 was a landmark year for the grounds team. The remit given from the university was the expansion of biodiversity across all sites and was the start of an exciting new chapter. We started small and created new habitats like this one at our Limes Court residence. We utilised unused raised beds, planting them up with pollinator friendly plants. We have added habitat piles, insect refuges and wildflowers at all our sites. This is a close-up of a bee hotel that was donated by a charity called Bug Life. Um, this is our Limes Court site. You'll see these dotted about in various other places. The next few slides show some of our bee and insect hotels. Most of them have been handcrafted by our talented joiner, Neil. I think you will agree, he's made excelled himself with this insect refuge built from material foraged from the flood line along the banks of the River Ouse. If you install a bee hotel at home, you might be lucky enough to get this sort of scenario. This, uh, this is male masonry bees prospecting around the front of my bee hotel, waiting for the young ladies to hatch out. As you can see, it's very busy. I've actually got a wooden bench underneath there, um, which I sit out, have my beer, drink my cups of tea, etc. And they are completely harmless. They won't bother you at all. With all things in nature, the predators decide to move in. This is what they call a nano wasp. She's looking for somewhere to lay her eggs. She will lay her eggs in a pupae of one of the masonry bees. This will hatch out inside the, the uh, pupae of the masonry bee, eat the bee, masonry bee from the inside, and then eventually hatch out to complete the cycle once again. Since creating the wild area at the Lord, back of Lord Mayor's Walk campus, tawny mining bees have taken up residence. They will start appearing as soon as the weather starts to warm up. If you take a look, you may find them in any area where you see what looks like worm castings. If you look a little bit closer into the hole, you'll probably find the tawny mining bee just poking her nose out and protecting her offspring. We're also very pleased that we have the wool card bee, uh, also known as the statues card bee, um, on site at Lord Mayor's Walk. And you'll find this on its two favourite plants. First one, lavender, and the second one, the statues, Byzantinia, which is also known as Lamsia. And you can find this plant on the Serpentine Walk at the front of Lord Mayor's Walk campus. I'd now like to welcome Nadine to do a presentation on hedgehogs. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Hi, my name is Nadine, and I'm a gardener with the York St. John Grounds team. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the hedgehog and take you through some of the things that we've been doing on campus to help this little guy out. So, there are 17 species of hedgehog in the world, from the African pygmy to the Indian long-eared. In the UK, we have one type of hedgehog, which is the European hedgehog, Erinaceus europaeus. Now, to give you a brief 101 on hedgehogs, 
they are spiny. The spines are made of keratin, just like human hair and nails, and they're part of their defensive mechanism. Now, unfortunately, they're their only defense mechanism because hedgehogs don't have flight or fight or flight. So when startled, they will actually just curl up in the ball to defend themselves. Unfortunately, that makes them very vulnerable to damage by humans. Um, they're small, they're only about 30 centimeters big at the most. They're nocturnal and they actually have poor eyesight. So they navigate mostly by smell. They're never out in the day and they don't sunbathe. So the most important thing about that is if you see a hedgehog out at in the day, then it's probably in trouble or its habitat's been disturbed. And, and the last thing about them is they travel for food. They travel up to two kilometers a night, which is essential for them to get enough food. And so access and freedom to roam is essential for a hedgehog. Talking about the hedgehog diet, not as many slugs as you'd think, actually surprisingly, uh, less slugs than snails and actually more beetles. Um, but they are what we call um, opportunistic omnivores and that they actually eat a really wide range of insects and things. They'll eat birds, bird eggs, they'll eat baby rodents, frogs, they'll eat carrion and they'll eat fallen fruit. They also supplement their diet with wet and dry cat and dog food that people leave out for them. Um, where they're found is actually pretty much all of the UK except for extreme areas. So everywhere except for like moorlands, marshlands and pine forests, you'll find hedgehogs. And in fact, now the greater density is actually in the east of England. Um, so we're more likely to see one here than maybe somebody in Cornwall. Um, hedges, they are called hedgehogs for a reason. Um, hedgehogs provide the perfect balance of shelter, of food and of a corridor to roam along. Um, but they are found in both rural and urban areas. And in fact, urban gardens can provide every everything that a hedgehog needs in terms of the same things. And as the um, farmed landscape becomes intensified, actually urban gardens can offer a better habitat now than, than a lot of farmland. Um, so talking about hibernation, they usually hibernate around October, November through to March, April. They enter a state of torpor where the body temperature drops to match those of their surroundings. And actually, if you find a hibernating hedgehog, it is quite likely to look dead to you because they don't move. So, and the main thing about them is that they don't always stay in hibernation. They actually move during warm periods during winter. They can actually wake up and roam around for food. Now that can actually be a problem with climate change because it costs them energy to wake up and find food and go back to sleep again. And the more periods there are like that over their winter, the more of a problem it is to them. They have to be at least 600 grams when they hibernate for the winter and they lose a third of that while they're hibernating. This is just a brief overview of the life cycle of a hedgehog. You can see you've got the hibernation period, then you've got replenishing of fat reserves, you are most likely to see a hedgehog between May and October really, and then most likely to see the hoglets out of the nest between July and October. Now the bad news about hedgehogs, I'll just get this little guy going, is that they're in decline and in 2020 they were added to the IUCN red list as vulnerable to extinction. We've gone from potentially 36.5 million hedgehogs in the 1950s to 1.5 million in 1995 and um, they think we've lost a third of those hedgehogs since the millennium. So the situation is critical at the moment for hedgehogs. Which leads us to what we can do about it. One of the things we can do about it is what we're doing here at York St John, which is the Hedgehog Friendly Campus Campaign, which is funded by the British Hedgehog Preservation Society. It works with schools, colleges and universities and encourages a range of activities to help hedgehogs and improve their offering as well as improve their protection. So one of the many things we've done as part of our activities is to run hedgehog surveys where we've put tunnels out with food and bait traps and we've basically recorded the footprints that we've had in the tunnels, which is how we know that we have an active population of hedgehogs. This is footage here when we put a wildlife camera out that we managed to capture of one of the hedgehogs that was visiting our tunnels. So this is one from a September survey and actually because because we were able to capture this footage and know we had hedgehogs, taking advice, we actually used the tunnel as a feeding tunnel throughout the whole autumn in an attempt to help feed the hedgehogs up for winter. We've 
-hmm. and get to the next slide. We worked really hard to increase our food provision for hedgehogs as well. I don't think it'll let me go on to the next slide until I finish that. There we go. So we worked really hard to increase our food provision for hedgehogs. So as well as by planting wildflower areas, we've um, increased the range and diversity of planting across all of our sites. We've put water bowls out. We've got feeding stations coming soon, thanks to our joinery department. We've also tried to increase the habitat for hedgehogs that we've got. We've planted new hedge lines, we've built hibernaculums, we've provided habitat piles, and we've even started a dead hedge up at Haxley Road. So because of all the work we've done, we've managed to achieve silver last year, which we're really proud of. And this year, we're gonna be working towards the gold standard, which we have a range of new initiatives we've been looking at, but the main thing we need is people to join and help us out. So just talking briefly about what you can do to help hedgehogs, most of the same things that we do on campus can be done in your own gardens. Um, stop using pesticides, um, let your garden be more messy, grow a wild variety of plants and mostly don't litter. Litter is a real hazard to hedgehogs and it accumulates in the places where they feed and shelter. Be careful when you strim and importantly, allow access for hedgehogs to move around. If you find a poorly hedgehog, if, it's a, if you see a hedgehog out at night and it seems happy and it's moving with purpose, the best thing you can do is not touch it, leave it alone. But if you find it out in the day and it looks damaged or it looks in trouble, the best thing you can do is contact the rescue centre. So either the British Hedgehog Preservation Society, the RSPCA, or there are a plethora of local rescue centres which you can contact. So you just need to look online for advice. So hopefully with help, we can help the numbers recover and save hedgehogs from extinction. Thank you. I'll pass over to Rob now to talk to you about birds. Hi, my name is Rob and I'm a gardener here at YSJ. Um, I volunteer to be bird champion as part of the biodiversity drive here and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing to monitor and help um, the birds that we've got here across our sites. Um, over the last couple of years we've built and installed over 120 different nest boxes across all of our sites uh, from here at Lomez Walk to our accommodation sites around town and up at Haxby Road. And uh, we've got many different sizes and designs, and they have all been built by uh, this man. Again, Neil gets around a bit. He's, a, he's a, <coughs> a joiner here at YSJ. He's also got a keen interest in birds himself, and it's been a pleasure working with him as he's just as passionate about his work he does with us uh, as we are as well. And um, some of the different designs we've got, this is an open front of design, which could be suitable for birds such as a robin or a wren, flycatcher. They prefer this type of box. We've also installed quite a few sparrow terraces, which are um, suitable for house sparrows. The house sparrows have been in decline for quite some time, so I think it's quite important to get plenty of these terraces up around <coughs> all our sites and their, their communal nesters there to hang around together. So we've got sort of three boxes together uh, quite, in quite a few different areas. Um, these are also five boxes here at Lord Mayor's Walk, which again could be used as a communal nesting area for, for house sparrows, but we've actually seen this year a um, blue tits and great tits prospecting these boxes as well. So they could be used by a variety of species, you know, as long as they get used, then we feel that like it's a win-win it's a situation really for us and the birds. And we've also got some single uh, small hole nest boxes across this site in particular. And these have had a lot of interest last year from blue tits and almost all the boxes that we put up were, were used to a certain degree. Um, some had partial nests in, some had full nests, some actually laid eggs, some chicks fledged, some failed. But one box in particular, this one at, uh, at the front of the university, uh, the fledglings uh, successfully fledged. So uh, not bad really for the first year. And uh, <clears throat> we know this happened because uh, we monitored the boxes throughout the breeding season last year. And um, we passed on all the data to the BTO, which is the British Trust for Ornithology, via their nest record scheme, which we're a part of here at YSJ. 
and hopefully we can continue to do that in the future and maybe get some staff and students involved as well, which would be brilliant. Um, we've also made some larger boxes uh, for raptors or birds of prey, as we've got quite a few of these around uh, town and, and up at our Haxton Road site, and they, they include Kestrel Box, the, the, uh, the one down on the left, and the bigger Barn Owl Box on the right. Now, we know we've got Barn Owls near our Haxton Road site, as they have been spotted in a nearby nature reserve at New Earswick. And, uh, <clears throat> and so we mounted the boxes on telegraph poles, and then it was a, a full team effort to get them in place, but it, but it worked out really well. And uh, the boxes, two of them went up uh, <clears throat> quite easily, really. And this is a picture of one of the boxes in situ that are put um, next to our football fields up at Haxby Road, overlooking a large sort of open field, which would be great for um, any prey that the owl would, would want to eat. It's got a good flight path in, good field of vision, facing northeast away from the, the hot sun and the prevailing winds. And so no takers as yet, but hopefully we'll, we'll keep an eye out this year and uh, we, we might get some takers on that. And a different type of owl box is this one that's uh, for a tawny owl. And this is also up at Haxby Road on a tree near our allotment site. And um, we know this has had a bit of interest because um, we've had some owl pellets found at the bottom of the tree. Now owl pellets are just sort of the regurgitated remains that the, of the prey that the owl can't digest, mainly like the bones of the, the vole or whatever it's eating, the fur and that, and it can't digest them properly. So it, so it brings it back up. And these are clear indicators that, you've had, uh, <coughs> that we've had an owl nesting nearby or at least landing nearby. And um, also valuable evidence is this short video of the tawny owl coming in. We mounted a nest box camera facing that box and we got a visit from the owl who's taking a bit more interest in the camera rather than the box but it's still clear evidence that we've got owls around and hopefully if he just kicks the squirrels out of the box and moves it himself then we'll, we'll, we'll be on uh, to a winner there you can just see the box in the background on the tree and uh, so watch the space and then also in January this year we put up our kestrel box we've had kestrels in the area Again, up at Haxby Road, and they take quite readily to, to these types of boxes. <coughs> and so hopefully we'll put a, a trail cam out facing this box and um, we'll, we'll carefully monitor it this, this season and see if we get any takers there. So it's all just waiting patiently, really. The last raptor box we made, by far the biggest, is one for the Peregrine Falcon. And... Um, York Minster already has a, a nesting pair of peregrines. They, they don't mind urban areas. They like to be up high. And uh, we've mounted our box on top of our YSJ central site, which is right in the, in the centre of town. Hungate is seven storeys up. So it's a great opportunity, hopefully, for um, some of the offspring of the Minster pair. Maybe they, when they get, get going in their life, they, they can find our box and move in, hopefully. And uh, we've got a trail come up there at the minute monitoring that. So as soon as we see any activity, we can, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know. And uh, hopefully we can get a permanent live feed up there in the future, which would be great. And as with the other boxes, um, it would be great if we did get any breeding birds in these, um, these larger boxes to, to try and monitor them and pass on any information to the, uh, to the BTO as well, which would be great. There's just a new view of the box right on the top of the roof there next to the, next to the solar panels. And lastly, we've been working on a project to help this bird, which is the swift. Uh, and if you look up on a sunny day between sort of mid-April and August, you're bound to see and, and hear this, uh, this fantastic bird flying about, screeching about. But sadly, it's, it's in massive decline due to a number of factors. But fortunately here at Lord Mayor's Walk, we do have a number of um, nesting sites for the swift. Um, they return each year to the same nest site. So it's important to, um, to safeguard their future. And we've been doing that by putting together a protection plan that hopefully will um, eliminate any building works that would make their, their nest sites disappear. But as well as protecting what we've got, we've also tried to make some new provision for them. And um, <clears throat> this is a, a collection of 15 swift boxes sort of put together in a sort of terrace on a cylindrical tower we've got here on Lord Mayor's Walk. And again, made by Neil the joiner. 
here he is, very pleased with his work and uh, he's made a fantastic job of that. <clears throat> and I had the pleasure of helping him install that. So hopefully we can get some Swiss in there for the next few years. He did make the boxes to um, a specific design, which is suitable for Swiss. You can see the entrance hole is a certain shape and design there. He did tweak them a bit just to make them curved and fit together onto this tower. But the, um, but the entrance holes, as you can see here, more towards the bottom. So the Swifts don't come back till sort of mid to late April. And by then, other birds can sometimes use these sort of nests to build their own, um, to, to, to lay their own eggs. And by having the entrance holes right down on the bottom can sometimes deter these other garden birds from using it. So we'll see if that works. And here's the tower in full. Um, I think as well as being a great thing for the strips it's also a nice bit of artwork really and a, and a great uh, great bit of design for me so that was that's fantastic and then we've also been um decided to put some swift boxes on the quad because we've got quite a lot of nesting swifts around the quad they've got um they nest in, in under the eaves at the quad our oldest building on lord mayor's walk but instead of fitting boxes on the outside of the of the building try to preserve the look of the building we've actually put the boxes on the inside behind these sort of um, small windows, if you like. And so that's a view from inside the building. Four swift boxes there, same design as usual. And that's a close up of inside. That's what we call a nest cup. Now the swift doesn't really make a nest as such with, with feathers. <clears throat> they just sort of um, lay their eggs in a scrape or they would in, in, in nature. So we've sort of incorporated this sort of scrape design into the box which will hold on to the eggs, stop them from rolling about. And that's, um, that's a proven uh, design, part of the design. And um, also the roof space is accessible. And hopefully if we do get any nesting swifts in there and they have young, we'd be working with um, a guy from the BTO and he's a qualified bird ringer. So hopefully in the future, if we do get some, um, some takers in here, we have got access to be able to come and ring the birds, maybe put date tags on, things like that. And then all this is valuable information for the Swift as it, as I said before, it's declined. So any, any sort of information we can get as to their habitat and their, and their whereabouts is all, is all good really. And that's not a bad view from your bedroom window. If you are a Swift living in the, in the quad view of York Minster there. And lastly, we've made another one just inside the quad. Similar design as before, just three boxes on this one, just because that, that's all we could fit in. Uh, but hopefully, um, <clears throat> with this one and the other swift boxes we've installed, that takes our total to 27 on site now. And then together with the existing nest sites that they use, we hope to um, increase our population of swifts quite, uh, quite rapidly here at York St. John. Thank you very much.